Yeah, there he is. I love seeing what they come up with for these series. I never see them until Sunday morning. So good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good morning, everybody. It's the humidity, I know. We are all got melting hair because humidity has arrived in Austin, Texas. If I don't have the pleasure of knowing you, my name is Will Davis Jr. Welcome to Austin Christian Fellowship. It's great to have you. If you're a first timer, second timer, spy, mystery shopper, whatever, uh, we're glad you're here. You can let us know if you want to with a connect card, which is available on the guest table or online. We won't hound you or harass you. If you need a Bible, Will you please raise your hand? Uh, take a Bible. We give away Bibles every single week. We love doing it. You can, you can take it. You can give it away. Uh, I always say you can sell it on eBay, but I want you to tithe on the receipts that you get for that, please. And find Matthew chapter 13 in your copies of Scripture, whatever you have, Matthew 13. Uh, a little bit of preamble. You noticed um, coming in the tents, um, our barbecue team, which we affectionately call burnt offerings here, if you didn't know that, uh, lighten things up, smelling good out there. And then the, the artisans on our patio are from Community First Village. Uh, there's some Community First paraphernalia out there, but most of the stuff you're going to see was made by the residents of Community First, which if you don't, don't know, is pretty much a unique on the planet residence for formerly homeless people. It's setting the trend worldwide and how this should be dealt with. And it's right here in Austin, Texas. We're good friends with these folks and support them significantly. I think we're giving them a million dollars over 10 years. So we're in heavy with Community First. Anyway, that's how they support themselves, some of them. So buy them out. The money, the money goes to Community First and to the artists, not to us. We don't get anything out of this. So I want there to be nothing left with second service, okay? So we, have to, so we have to bring them back. So consider the gauntlet thrown. Okay, two QR codes very quickly. This first one is from my wife's amazing uh, podcast. She's done a Dear Daughters podcast forever with um, over a million downloads. And she's shifted it this year for Nipsis on Prayer. It's called Simple Prayers. And so you can take a picture of that QR code and it'll take you to Susie's website and you can sign up for that. We've been talking about prayer. We'll keep talking about prayer. It seemed like a good time to show you this. You can also go to her website if you want to um, visit it there. And the next QR code is for this service. And that's, uh, we're showing, we're, if you want notes of the things on screen, and again, some of you are still taking pictures of Susie. You can go to Susie Davis. If you Google Susie Davis podcast, it'll come up. You can find it there. Uh, this is for notes from this message. I'm going to put a lot on screen. If you don't have to try to keep up with it or take pictures because they come out blurry and I'm in them, then just use the QR code and it's much better at the end. Okay, let's pray. Goodness, lots to talk about. Lord, um, it's a great day in Austin. Thank you for our neighbors on the, on the patio from Community First. Thank you for the people in the room, um, our regulars, our family that's here. First day of summer, first Sunday of summer anyway, and this amazing guests that are here as well. Uh, Lord, what uh, Sarah just saying, I will make room for you. Yeah, please. That'd be good. If we could all gear down a bit and sit quietly and turn our hands over and enjoy you a little more than we do, not be in such a hurry. Um, so as we talk about the kingdom and what it looks like in our lives, Help us to make room for the kingdom. Help us to look for the kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we begin a new series today. It's going to take us through the month of June. It's called Basileia, which is the Greek word for kingdom. Our word basilica comes from it. And we'd like to every once in a while introduce you to Greek words just because it's really cool to know to say that you know Greek. Kidding. Um, sometimes it opens up insights into uh, like the word ruah. Many of you remember from our series a year or two ago on the Holy Spirit, ruah, the breath of God. And that becomes part of your language. So basileia is what the writers used to write down the concept when Jesus talked about kingdom. And it just gets us a little bit closer to the original thinking and feeling of Jesus. So uh, what the teaching team came up with for this month was let's talk about the places in Matthew where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like 
he gives us these snapshots of what the kingdom of heaven is. And I know some of you, kingdom of heaven is a little bit out there concept. I'll get you to it today. But for the next, for the five weeks of June, we're going to talk about those places where said, in Matthew where Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And it's never, the kingdom of heaven is this big profound thing. It's like the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed or a grain of sand or a seed thrown on the ground or a child. So it's always this, this massive concept, the kingdom reduced into something really simple and discoverable which is what I want to talk to you about today. Um, so this is a bit of an intro into this series. Um, if you've ever wanted, when you get that phone call, if you've ever wanted to be able to look through the, the phone call into the bigger picture of God at work, or if you ever want, look at the, the headlines in the morning and go, oh God, and you wanna be able to see more of what's behind the headlines. If you ever are living through a difficult season or trying to make a strategic decision and you'd like to see more of the fingerprints of God in that, then I need you to listen today. Because those answers and those codes, there's kingdom code, friends, everywhere. The code of the kingdom, I'm thinking like computer code which I know absolutely, I just told you what I know about it. I know it exists. That's all I know about it. It's everywhere. So, Matthew 13, verse 10, Jesus begins in Matthew 13 with a parable of soil and seed. And it's a bit of an interesting they know he's saying something, but they're not really sure what he's saying, which is kind of what parables do, is they, they like kind of hide truth for you to go figure it out. It's not all there, it's like kind of subtle and you have to dig to figure out the point, which is what Jesus wants you to do. And so he talks about the soils and seeds and birds and some seed bears fruit, some doesn't. And then the disciples in verse 10, in Matthew 13, the disciples came to him and said, why do you do that? Why don't you just tell us what you're trying to say? You ever felt like asking Jesus that question, by the way? Why do you, why do you talk in, what, why code? The disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered and said, to you, plural, disciples, believers, people of faith, it has been given or granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it's not been granted. Now, that sounds really harsh. By the way, that's the first use of the phrase kingdom of heaven in Matthew, which is why I picked it. You, you guys get to know they don't. Well, that doesn't sound like a very good church growth or evangelistic strategy, you know? So, so he's, he's saying, I'm talking deliberately in some code and there's reasons for it. So let me give you some definitions. The first definition is the word parable. Jesus taught them in parables. Here's the definition of parable. And again, you're going to want to maybe get these later if you don't take pictures now. A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. It's the simple illustrating something greater. Now, I would probably add a word to this. It's a simple story used to illustrate a, a typically profound moral or spiritual lesson. So it's the simple explaining the profound, which is what we need. Now notice that Jesus used the word the mysteries. In our teaching team, we talk a lot about mystery, which basically anything having to do with God is mystery. He is infinite, he is holy, he's otherworldly, he's timeless, he's not of this planet, he's not of flesh, and if he, mystery is shrouded, and those of us who are not keepers of the secrets of the mystery can never know the mysteries unless they're unlocked from inside. So we say the word revelation is when mysteries, which we will not know otherwise, are revealed. When someone who has the information makes it known, then it becomes public knowledge. 
So Jesus says the mysteries, those secrets, that ability to read the headlines and see things going on, that ability to get the phone call and listen for, the, for God in that phone call, or to make a strategic decision and see the fingerprints of God, or be walking through a beautiful day and see code of kingdom everywhere, that doesn't come to just everybody. That's the word parable. Kingdom of heaven is what I call the rule and reign of God on earth through his people, that's us, by his Holy Spirit. Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. Luke uses the phrase kingdom of God. They use them interchangeably. Matthew was writing to Jews and he didn't want to offend the Jewish people by using God in too much of a common or ordinary way, so he chose heaven. Luke was writing to Gentiles and didn't want to confuse them by calling the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven, so he called the kingdom of God. Same reality, different audiences, different verbiage. Matthew uses heaven because he wants to appeal to his Jewish readers. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is that, that place where God is ruling and reigning through the power of his Holy Spirit in his people. It is not based on borders. It's not based on language. It's not based on culture. It's not based on time. So if you could put a little red dot on every home, every hut, every apartment, every street corner with the homeless on it that are people of God and connect those dots through invisible lines, you'd see that uh, laser-like net that's the kingdom. It's everywhere. Connected by belief um, in you and in me. It's plural. The kingdom is unexistent in me. It exists in us. Jesus is my Savior. Christ is our Lord. Christ is the, the plural rule of God. It's, he's Christ to his people. He's Jesus to me. He, the Christ rules his kingdom. He rules the people. There's a lot of stuff, first thing for June, I apologize. There's a lot of content making you think this morning. So if you could connect on a map, every Christ follower on the planet and their tribe, you'd see this net of where the kingdom is. It's invisible, but it's real, and it's, it's greater than governments will rise and fall, the kingdom will not. And it's going to be ushered in ultimately in a physical reign, as you read in Revelation, once history is done. Okay, it's a lot, of, lot to think about. Now, why would Jesus talk in code? Here's why. Because everything about God requires faith. Okay? That's a reality of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 1 and 2, Adam and Eve are bouncing around the garden. They don't need faith. There's God. They can see him. He's with them. But in Genesis chapter 3, when sin enters the world and they have to hide and cover themselves, now they're, now they're jettisoned from Eden and jettisoned from God's presence. And the reality from Genesis 1 and 2 all the way into Revelation 21 and 22 until we see God again is this, if you're going to know God, you've got to believe him but now by faith. You can't see him anymore. We've lost that promise. We've lost that ability. We can see of him. We can see his fingerprints. We can see his code. But we can't see him. And so if I'm going to have a relationship with God, it has to be by faith. So Jesus says the mysteries are going to only be made to people who believe. The mysteries will be revealed to people who have the courage to step outside their reason and what they think is humanly understanding. But the person who wants to God to sit down and defend himself like a peer or have God explain himself or, hey, God, you owe me an explanation, is never going to know the things of the kingdom. There's no humility there. There's no faith there. But the person who says, you know, God, you're still God. Your ways are higher. Your ways are greater. I seek you in faith. I seek you in humility. Jesus says, I will love to reveal my code to you. So you can read the headlines and see what's really going on. You can look at your life and see me working. You can know, even though you may not see it, that God is doing something. That's why Jesus speaks in faith. Because, I mean, in parables. Because... He doesn't just, it's, it's the pearls before swine. It's someone not of faith that doesn't know what to do with kingdom concepts. They'll mishandle them. 
So is God selective in what he reveals to people beyond his initial revelation of who he is? 100%. You require, it requires faith. If you don't have faith, you're not going to get much of God. Hebrews 11 says it's impossible to please God without faith. So that's why Jesus coded everything. He'll put it out there for you, but I want you to be hungry enough to pursue it and look for the truth in this thing because through faith, you're going to find amazing kingdom principles. So here's a statement on the screen. Everything, every aspect of your relationship with God is based on faith. Every single aspect. There's nothing about God you can prove or test tube or touch. It's all faith. And that's frustrating, but it's the world we live in because we lost access to God when we sinned. Jesus, the ultimate bridge on the cross, has come to rebuild the bridge and ultimately take the distance away between us and God, which is what Revelation talks about. But it's going to be a minute, so you've got to learn to have faith. Can you tell I didn't preach last weekend? I'm kind of, I got a lot of, no, I did preach last weekend. And st- never mind. Still backed up. It's bad. If you want to know the mysteries of God's kingdom, you must develop your faith. Let me give you a one-word definition, a one-word way, so easy. Here we go. Here's one way to grow your faith. Most of you say, like, increase your knowledge of God. That is not how you learn God. That's how you learn about God. The way you increase your knowledge of God is obedience. Everybody say, ouch. Didn't see that coming. You experience the kingdom and more of God through ex- you experientially through obedience. It's not learning about him, it's learning him. You get God's code when God says, hey, I want you to do something. I want you to step up and step out and move a direction toward me. It's going to have a little bit of risk in it. It's going to have some pain in it. Maybe or some fear in it because you're taking a step that you're not, a, not aware of. And I will meet you in that step and then you're going to learn more of me. You can't learn more of me if you don't obey because the whole obedience thing requires what? Faith. So obedience is the practice of faith. It's faith in action. And that's where you meet God. It's where you learn the secrets of the kingdom. It's in faith. Well, faith is the, the breeding ground for faith is, is obedience. Not knowledge. Knowledge is great. I know a lot about God because I read the Bible, but I know God through obedience. That makes sense? Do your heads like that because i got to move on. Act like you understand. Okay. Example. Um, two weeks ago, I... Two, two or three Sundays ago, I taught in a, a church in Katy, Texas, Kingsland Baptist Church, in honor of a friend of mine, Ryan Rush, who used to be a pastor here. It's his 10-year anniversary, and they did a fun thing and celebrated him, and I got to be the guest roast guy. Uh, and they have three services, and I just, get, I'm so, I get bored doing, the, doing two of the same messages is hard for me, because I can't remember what I said when. And at some point, I want a bigger challenge, so I just said to Ryan's folks, I'm doing a different sermon each service. And I had an idea of what they're going to be, but I didn't really know for sure. Well, the third service, I talked about lessons from 30 years at ACF. Ryan, you're a lightweight. You've been here 10 years. Let me tell you what church is really like. Okay, that's basically what I said to him. Call me in 20 years. And I was going to talk about prayer and giving, generosity, and something else. And I got to prayer and never went past it. I couldn't couldn't get off of prayer. And so I had 25 minutes, and I talked about prayer and quit. I noticed as soon as the service was over, this couple, I noticed when I was talking, this couple early rose in just melting, breaking down. They're probably in their 60s and they're just melting, breaking down, like weeping uncontrollably while I'm teaching. As soon as the service is over, they bolt to the stairs of the altar and start praying, like collapse of the altar and start praying. Not the sharpest tool in the shed, but something's up. So I met some people and I've, I've jumped into that huddle and said, okay, help me understand. You guys don't know me, but something, what's God doing? She said, tomorrow we go to a court hearing to see if we can get full and complete custody of our grandson who was standing right there. He's about six. And there are some bad players, distant relatives in his life that are trying to keep that from happening. And she said, I haven't had the courage to ask God to come through for us until today. Because I talked about it's impossible to overpray and how dare you insult God with small prayers, pray the kind of prayers that requires God to act like God, all those things. And she said, we're, she said, we're crying out for God to come through. 
And so I said, would you please write me and let me know how this goes? Regardless of what happens, because it's never the end, let me know how it goes. Well, we didn't hear from him for like a week, and then we found the email in our, my trash folder. It got spammed. She'd written the next day. And something had happened in the court that she called the God bullet, that just the judge was stunned when he heard it and said, this hearing is over. I grant full custody immediately right now to this family. And no visitation rights, this kid is now yours. And she said, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have known to pray that if we hadn't have been at the 11 o'clock service. And she said, we always come to 9.30 and we were late that day because I preached a different sermon at the 9.30 service. Didn't talk about prayer at all. But she said, something happened and we came to 11 and we got convicted to take a risk and to ask God to do something that was terrifying. What if he says no? And we got a yes. We obeyed and we got a yes. And we now see a level of God we have never seen before. That's how the kingdom works, friends. But you gotta be looking for it. They're late, I'm talking about prayer. I'm talking about don't insult God with small prayers. And she's sitting there going, I have not had the courage to tell God how I really feel about this and I'm doing it today. I'm not gonna go to this hearing having not required God to act like God in my prayers. Because he told me I could. That's how the kingdom works. So where is that point of obedience that you're hedging on? That's keeping you from seeing the kingdom in a whole different level. And we've all got them. I've got areas where God wants more of me. Come on, Davis, let's go. And what that is, is when I obey him, I get more of him. I don't get more about him, I get more of him. So some of you are sitting on a precipice and you're like, oh, I don't, you know, it's tithing for some of you, or it's learning to talk to your neighbors about Christ, or it's being more vulnerable in a community small group, or being in a small group, or addressing an unconfessed sin, or learning to be more free in worship, or whatever. You know there's a nudge. Well, on the other side of that, on the other side of that nudge is more of God and more of his kingdom today. There's just things you can't learn about him until you step out and obey. And in the obedience, you get more of God. You get more of the kingdom. So the way the mysteries of the kingdom are revealed, they come through faith. The language of faith is obedience. Okay? Okay, now very quickly, turn a page to the same chapter to verse 31 of Matthew 13. Because here is the first parable in Matthew where he says the kingdom of heaven. There's other parables before this in Matthew. This is the first time he says the kingdom of heaven is like. I'm just gonna touch this before we try to wrap this up. He presented another parable to them, Matthew 13, 31. He presented another parable to them. Remember what's a parable? It's a simple, profound, it's a simple lesson introducing us to profound realities. The kingdom of heaven is like, and you would expect him to say, the universe, right? No, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Think grain of salt on steroids. Like maybe two grains of salt. I've held a mustard seed in my hand. Well, actually, I've been harvesting, because I'm a very cool Texas person, I've been harvesting blue bonnet seeds out of our blue bonnets. I'm going to plant them in my yard for more blue bonnets next year. Blue bonnet seeds are about the size of half of a pea. Okay? Mustard seeds are about a half size of that. Okay? And so he says, the kingdom of heaven is like half of a blue bonnet seed, bird seed, basically. Which, kingdom of heaven... It's like bird seed. Really? Which a man took and sowed in his field, and it, this is smaller than, although it's smaller than all the other seeds, when it's full grown, it's larger than the garden plants, becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Okay, so there's, king, there's code for the kingdom. So what do you learn about the kingdom? I want you to think, it just, think about your teaching this back in Camp Fun. You got to teach it to six-year-olds. So the kingdom of heaven 
is like bird seed or like a blue bonnet seed or not near the size of an acorn, but what comes out of an acorn? A massive centuries, growth of centuries oak tree. So, so what's the profundity, the code there that Jesus is talking about in his kingdom? It doesn't matter how small it starts. It's, it'll, it's as small as you need it to be to fit into your heart. But if you water it through obedience, it'll grow into this massive thing that can provide for others and become a safe place and a beautiful thing, a thing that outgrows everything around it. Kingdom, kingdom seeds have potential that other seeds don't have. All that's in that little parable. Isn't that amazing? That's so amazing, right? Do you say, well, that's so amazing. So amazing. so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm never going to be the same. So the point about the kingdom there is it starts small and grows to infinite size. What I want to give you is that God uses simple and everyday, um, God uses the simple and the everyday to reveal profound eternal realities, okay? So that's where I want to send you out thinking. Is that if you'll learn, if you'll learn to look for code in the simple and the everyday, you'll find it. But you've got to look. I think we drive by code all the time because we're in a hurry. But I think if we do what Jesus, Sarah sang about him and go make room for God and slow down and, and look at flowers and look at the miracle of a newborn baby, look at a sunrise or a sunset, ask the question, why does rain have a smell? What's, what's the magic of those ice crystals and sunlight that produce a rainbow? What's, what's that? See, those, those here you go. Those, those earthly realities, those earthly examples are all reflections of bigger kingdom reality. So when you bump into something like that, because like, even the, the tabernacle, the temple, where the, we worshiped in Jesus' day, the way it was laid out was a reflection of things, realities in heaven that were reduced to simple Things, because the realities of heaven are beyond our understanding. But Jesus puts secrets all over the planet to show us what's really going on. So, wind, we've talked about wind so many times, is a reflection of a bigger kingdom reality. Water. I was watering my plants this morning in my office before I came over here. I thought about it. Isn't it interesting that plants require water to grow? Chris Tapkin, our prayer leader, loves to talk about roots. And root system being as dramatic and as important underground as what you see above ground and the discipleship principles of roots and a, a, a tree well planted. So if you'll learn to look for the, if you ask questions about these things on earth, you get, I remember last week I said, you know, animals, specifically cats and dogs, are reflections of the spiritual reality of angels and demons. You get to figure out which one represents which. Okay. Sorry, I'm just just trying to wait and lighten you guys up a little bit this morning. You're so heavy. It's the humidity, and I could do it all day. If you don't get going with me, I'm going to be here all day doing this. But I really do want you to think about those. So here's what I want you to do: I want you to pray for illumination. Illumination is a really wonderful 25 cent church word. It just means light coming on. The very remember Genesis 1:3. What's what's the very first thing God created? Tell me, light. So God makes the heavens and the earth. It's full of chaos. And he says, okay, let there be light, which means everything that comes after this is going to be revelation. Everything, it's not just let the force of light be created because that didn't happen until day three or four when God put the sun and moon in place and time officially began. So there's more going on in Genesis 1-3 than just light like we see here. There's something, let there, be revel, let there be illumination, let there be knowledge. So everything that happens after Genesis 1-3 is so that everything that follows Genesis 1-3 can know the God who existed before Genesis 1-3. Okay? Let there be illumination, let there be knowledge, let the people know me. Let there be light, let there be revelation. 
And so he wants to reveal himself and he, he loves to put little things around to, so you have those God notes, those surprises where you bump into God in a day and go, wow, it's so cool. And they're in fingerprints, they're in snowflakes, they're in that amazing code in nature called fractals, which is a repeating pattern in nature that's in ice and lettuce and lightning and all these things that appears to be infinitely repeatable. The more we, mag the more we magnify it, the more it's there. We can't find the bottom of it. Those, that's code. It's everywhere. It's in human DNA. Which if you mapped it, like take a phone book or a dictionary with the smallest font possible and stack it and it'd be as tall as the, the information in the DNA strand would be as tall as the Washington Monument, that thick with that kind of font. That's code, literally that's code for how humans exist. Well, that didn't just grow out of a tree. That's God saying, hey, look at me. And so Jesus says, I've hidden things everywhere for you. And if you'll look for them, you'll find me in them. So pray, pray for illumination. Okay, I gotta wrap this up. Let me tell you real quickly, and I'm gonna give you two things to, to say as a declaration. Let me tell you where we're going. Next week, my friend Chris Tapkin is gonna teach on thinking like a child, which seems very appropriate for Chris Tapkin. <laughs> Hope he's listening somewhere. The kingdom's heaven is like a seven-year-old. Not complicated, not sophisticated, just simple. Seven-year-old. There's a reason kids with autism tend to get God a whole lot better than the rest of us do. Ever thought about what God's telling us through special needs children? Even though he didn't create special needs children, he can still speak through them. Ever thought about that? Hmm. What's, where's the, where's the code in that? Hmm. He let me clarify, he creates every human. God did not create um, cystic fibrosis. God did not create cerebral palsy. God did not create Parkinson. God did not create autism. Those are Genesis three things, but he can, speak, he can meet us in them and speak through them is what I'm trying to say. He creates every human, they're made in his image. So let me make sure I clarify that. Send all emails to Chris Tapkin, care of Austin Christian Fellowship. <laughs> The June 16th, Lauren Thurston is gonna be teaching on finding your higher purpose. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. That when you find the treasure, you run and sell all that you have and buy the, buy the field to get the treasure. What's life really about? I'll be back on the 23rd to teach about releasing unforgiveness. The kingdom of heaven is like a guy who paid workers who worked eight hours and guys who worked eight minutes, the same thing. Hmm. Actually, that's the parallel of grace that Michelle's teaching on. I stole her thunder. I'm teaching on the servants who weren't willing to forgive each other, even though God had forgiven them. We talk about unforgiveness. I don't know what I'm teaching on. It's going to be a great series, so come back. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm saying in three weeks. Okay, two declarations. You ready? Declaration number one. These will be in your notes if you want them. I will develop my eye of faith and seek out kingdom truths in the everyday. Start looking for God in the everyday. Have the, the willingness to ask the question, where is God in this? You'll see him, you'll find him. So de declaration, I'm gonna walk out of here and see if I can see God in some of these neighbors on the community first tables or in the flowers are still in my front yard left over from spring or in the weather patterns see everything is of god he's even behind the headlines he's working so what does he look for the code it's there secondly whew, i will be part of jesus prayer i'll be part of the answer to jesus prayer let your kingdom come well are you building a kingdom place are you living a kingdom life? Are you encouraging kingdom behaviors? Are you inviting kingdom realities? Are you seeking kingdom truths? So when Jesus said, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, some of that until it's ultimately fulfilled in Revelation is up to us. Isn't that interesting? Is the kingdom at your address? Is the kingdom at your place of business? Is the kingdom when you're out with your friends? Is the kingdom there? The Holy Spirit through God's people who are aligned in Jesus' name. 
So you be part of the answer to let your kingdom come. Okay, well, Jesus, I'm in. It's right here. It's in us. Be part of that solution. It's going to be a great month. We're going to learn so much. Stay tuned. And let me pray. And we'll dismiss here. Lord God, thank you for the time. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for profound truths and simple, everyday realities. Help us to seek them out. As one teacher loves to say, God, you don't hide them from us, you hide them for us, like Easter eggs. Help us to seek them out and be changed by them. I pray for that person on the edge of obedience. They'll take that step, say that yes, and find you in the process. And I pray this in your name. Amen. You guys online, we love you. Hope to see you soon. See you next week.